Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I am good. I'm good. You have a good week. You're judging from Twitter. It looks like you were playing another big room. Were you at I've Wembley been or something? Lots of big rooms. I don't know why. I've I sort of resist them. I, I you know I've I've played them all before, but um I think I really went to town and soaked up everyone who wanted a ticket this time. It's probably to do with COVID and mm -hmm. but yeah, I'm playing. I'm sort of playing to more people than ever, and it's uh it's going great. And I want to take all the credit. I want to think that. It's because whereas the... it's really a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, it's just they can't, they can't believe they're out. Right. They can't. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. The angel and of the... death is is your uh, publicist. No. Uh, yeah. No. It's really gone down well, and people are loving it. That you know, that it, it's big rooms, and it, it's just gone down better than anything I've ever done. And uh, mm. but um, well, I like one tweet. Someone, I, I did a picture of the big room, and it, it looks. It just looks enormous, right? And it's yeah. packed out, and they hold, it just looks crazy, right? And someone said, and Gervais wept, for there was no one else to offend. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty great tweet. That's great, yeah. isn't it? I just put that on the, uh, yeah, on the, the poster. That's awesome. I've been, uh, I, I, I've been working hard. But it's funny because... It still doesn't feel like work. Like I've been on tour now. I, at the pandemic, I put, you know, Afterlife, I finished Afterlife 2, uh, Afterlife 2, finished Afterlife 3 during the pandemic, waiting to come out. Uh, all these tours. And I feel that I haven't worked yet because it's not creative. Mm. I, because the tour was already written, that's the bit to me that feels like work. This feels like I'm going around collecting money. Do, do you know what I mean? Mm. Does that make sense? Like I'm performing, it's hard work and I'm doing my best and it's, it clearly is work, but because I've done it every night and I know it's going to work every night, yeah, it yeah. doesn't feel creative. It's too, it's too easy, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's just something weird that I feel that... Well, you, you have a very different, because, I mean, this is, I guess, every stand-up comic is in this position, but because you have your act completely worked out, I mean, by necessity, that's what you're doing. It, I mean, it's, it's like a play, you're doing, you're, you're doing a play. Right. Yeah, yeah, but it, it does evolve, and if something happens, and I, it, it, it still gets a little bit better every night. So mm. there's still that, and it's, it's still an amazing buzz. It's incredible to play that yeah. many people and make them laugh, and they all laugh at the same time. You know, it, it, it's quite incredible. But I don't know. I think it's because I like the creative process more than any other part of it, and that's right. and that feels like it's done. I mean, most stand-ups that play rooms like that. They haven't written it. They've written part of it, but they use writers. Right. I, 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 I couldn't believe how many. Is that really true? Are, I, 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 well, yeah, I was well. shocked that, I, and I won't, I won't say anything. But people that okay, I want the list. Let's re no, reveal no, the list. But, you know, it's <laughs> like uh, I can't believe I do it all myself. I think I've been an idiot. Right. I think next time <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to write get a guest script. <laughs> you do all your own stunts. You what are you crazy? I do all yeah. my own stunts. Yeah, <laughs> I have to do a funny walk in this one, and and and. It's touch and go whether my back goes or not. Mm. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, wait a minute. But you've been doing these enormous shows in a comparatively small pond. I mean, you're not, you're, you're doing all of this in England, right? So, is there. Uh, no, no, I played uh, I, uh, before the pandemic. I did mostly European ones. Right. But I mean, um, but now, then, I mean, you've been doing week after yeah. week in England. Is yeah. there any danger that you're going to, you're going to, open at uh, Wembley one night and no one's going to show up because you've just done too many shows in England? Well, no, because they've won all these shows of, they've sold out in advance. I never, you, there's you, no you, you, there's, there's never, it's not like opening a restaurant where you don't know no, what's going to happen. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't care if they don't turn up. They've paid. <laughs> I've spent the money. Yeah. So no, it's always, it's always capacity. And uh, yeah, and also, you, you know, England or, or U UK, there's nearly 70 million people. Right. Uh, I, that's not, I don't need a big percentage of those yeah. people to play gigs, you know. But still, also, you're, you're taking, Europe what well. is it, 10,000, 15,000 person chunks? How big are these rooms? Yeah, yeah. I'm, do, um, uh, I'm off to Dublin tomorrow to do two nights at 11,000 seat or whatever. Yeah, so that's incredible. 20,000 people. Uh, and I do, I do love it more than I used to. I used to love it being over, but now I quite look forward to it. And I don't know why that is. I think because I appreciate the audience more. Hmm. I, 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 I've, I realize how important it is to cut out the middleman. Mm -hmm. I'm not beholden to anyone. I'm not beholden to studios or producers or platforms. I go direct to the people and they always come out. And it's probably the most guaranteed thing I do. I put hmm. these tickets on sale 
and they sell out in minutes. Whereas anything you worry about, you know, ratings or cinema, uh, whereas this, see, oh, one day, it, I'm sure one day it'll go away. But uh, uh, I think I appreciate the audience more because we don't need anyone else. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I've realized that yeah. more and more. I, I, we don't need anyone else. There's nothing, you know. I said to a journalist, uh, he, he said, you're worried about how it's going to go down. I, I know it's going down. They're laughing every night. I mean, what do you mean my Rotten Tomato score? And uh, <laughs> it, 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 I said, said, no one's ever bought a house with a good Rotten Tomato score. <laughs> so it's, I'm going to come across as so arrogant. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've been thinking no, you, about you got to um, you got to change it, 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 when, when you upgrade to no one. No one's ever bought a plane with a rotten tomato score. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's what you um, need to really yeah, break, there, break yeah. your audience. Whoa! Uh, no one's ever bought a rocket to Mars. <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah. So I, I was been thinking about our conversation last time. Mm. It's that whether you go into the future, a hundred years, or the past. So it's it's such a great question because. It's like one of those creative writing questions I used to get. As a, and it, you can't work it out. You can't, there's always something opposed to it. And um, I was thinking that there is a way to go into the future, like we said, like you, you live out your mortal life, you're there forever, and you see 100 years in the future, which is obviously being cryogenically frozen. And I wanted to ask you, hmm. why isn't that possible yet? Why, why, why can't we do that? Well, people are doing it. You know, it, it just, they just seem a little nuts but um yeah but we never know if it's work no one's ever right. they haven't woken up walt disney yet have they and he no. goes oh i've got a slight <laughs> headache you know what i mean it's yeah. not i think there is um you know I, I don't know if in principle it can't work if it really is just a, a scam i i think it there's some foreseeable future where you could you know reanimate a, a frozen brain but i think there's also some concern that there's still a significant amount of damage done in the dying and freezing process, that it's just it's just not good enough to maintain everything in a state where you actually could uh, reboot it with, with without real data loss. So I, I don't. Actually, data, I haven't looked do into mean, it. Do you mean biological data or memories, like it being well, you? Yeah, I mean the, the same. Yeah, I mean just your your memories are biological data. You know, it's, it, it is a matter of you know, precisely the state of each synapse, and so it's, hold on it's, though. What is no, okay? So okay. So tell me what a memory literally is, without metaphor mm. or analogy. What is a memory then? What is it? Is it a tangent? Is it a is it a thing? Could you recreate it? Yeah, well, yeah. So I mean, unless there's something spooky that we don't yet understand, a memory, if a memory has to be a physical change in the structure of your brain, and it has to be almost by definition in order to be retrievable, right? In order to you know, you have an experience, or you, you assimilate a piece of knowledge, and then you go on and do other things, right? You're not, you're not maintaining the, the echoes of this information no. continuously on your hard drive. It can't be a process that has to run continuously. It has to be something that gets inscribed in some way. And we, and we know that, you know, this, if you block uh, genetic transcription of you know specific proteins and and you don't allow, you don't allow receptor densities to change at synapses yeah you, you you block the formation of memory so we know this is a matter of changing the physical structure of the brain and do you mean that's it why it's retrievable a particular state so if your brain if all the things <laughs> I haven't got all the, I haven't got the, the, the many vocabulary. things <laughs> I haven't got the tools <laughs> to ask this question right so the, the, okay, at, at any one time, the state of your brain, right, the, the, mm. uh, in position, the same synapses are, are firing, right, you get the same memory, you get the same picture, right? Would that make sense? Well, well it re so you, you have an experience and memory is, is one, that it is in fact an illusion to some significant degree that a memory is a faithful recapitulation of an experience it's it's not i mean it's it's a construct and it gets reconstructed every time you invoke it and and memories actually become pretty fragile and and, and easily disrupted when you're retrieving them this is how false memories get implanted and this is how this is why courtroom testimony can be so unreliable but you know generally speaking a, a memory a long-term memory is a matter of 
you know, physical changes in the brain, in, you know, in the connections between nerve cells. And those no, fit- but wait, wait. But you're talking about recall of a lived experience. Or anything, or a fact. Or you know, if I tell you... No, but it's not true. It's not the same as a fact, is it? Because we don't, we don't remember when we learn to count to one to ten, but we, can't, we never go right. wrong when we count to number ten. One okay, to ten. Yeah. What, what's the difference? Well, so we have this one word memory, which names many different processes, which are not the same, and they're not, they're not analogous. So you can, so the memory of you know what what your room looked like when you woke up this morning, right? Or the the memory yeah. of of what you had for breakfast. That, that's called episodic memory, and that, and that's a memory where you have a okay, kind of an echo of the visual images that you experienced that you know while you were actually seeing and having those experiences, that's distinct, you know, neurologically distinct from what's called semantic memory, where you, you remember facts, you, 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 you have pieces of knowledge that okay. don't, don't, don't have images necessarily associated with them. It's just, you know, you know, you're you know remembering that... them, you know it. So you're re-remembering them. There's, there's no way you, you go through every time you ever remembered them. You just right. come to the latest time you remember them and, yeah. they're, and they're the same because I see what you mean. It's like, so, like you know, just you know, your your knowledge of your knowledge that Bill Clinton was once president of the United States, right? So, like, you know, who yeah. was Bill Clinton? The fact that you can retrieve something there—that's that's semantic memory, but it's not necessarily right. associated with images. You're you're not placing yourself in a scene in the past where you were, you know, you're now recalling an experience. Okay. Unless you happen to know Bill Clinton and remember what it was like to hang out with him, you know, that that that, that would why, be an episodic memory. So why isn't memory of a, a an episode an episode, right? Why isn't that sort of photographic? Why don't I remember it? Why isn't it imprinted and then I look at it again like you're putting mm-hmm. up a file on your computer? Well, why is it why is that different in the brain? Because well, the for some people it is. I mean, for some people, it, it's a little hard to know to what degree this ability has been somewhat mythologized. But there, there are people that have what's called eidetic memories, you know, photographic memories, and can more or less demonstrate that they, uh, and I, again, there's, uh, I'm not sure, there, there's got to be some distance between just having a very good visual memory and having a true, yes. you know, photographic memory. But yeah, there are certainly people who can who seem to be able to look at a visual scene or a list of things, you know, for a very brief period of time, and then look away and faithfully recall everything that now was that there. Now that is that's a I, I don't I don't know what to use the term, but that's a condition, isn't it? That's your, your brain is different to ours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, some of this is trainable, but no, for the most part, there are people who just have this, and I I think I feel like we might have spoken about this before, but there are people who have perfect. Or seemingly, you know, near perfect, episodic memories where, you know, you can say, "What did you have for breakfast on January twenty fourth, nineteen eighty seven?" And they can tell you. And they can tell you about. They can tell you everything about that day. They can tell you what day it was. It's, I think. Did we? Did, did I, I think tell we, you I think the, we spoke um, about this. Yeah. What with that? That, that I, I think I saw that uh, documentary, Brain Man, mm-hmm. about the guy who you, he can multiply. You know, six figure number, yeah, figure, uh, numbers yeah. together and get the result. And he doesn't. He's not working it out. He's just he's being given the answer, so to speak. And he sees it as a shape. And they tested it. Scientists tested him, and they said, "What shape is this?" Three thousand four hundred twenty-five. And he made the shape out of plasticine. And they said times by you know one thousand. What's that shape? So what's the answer? And he drew the shape. And they left it six months, and they made him do it again, and the shapes were identical. Yeah. So he sees a a weird shape that represents a number, and it, that's something to do with a different sort of connection yeah, that, in his brain. That, that's called, uh, that condition is called synesthesia, where you have a crosstalk between the different senses. And yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, there, there are these you know, weird abilities that, um, that pe- these are not trained. I mean, there are people, there are, you know, there are calculation champions and, and, and memory champions who can train these yeah. abilities, but they're doing something different than the people who have it innately and who just, you know, they just stumble upon it in themselves and don't know how they're doing what they're doing. And, and the people who have these crazy episodic memories uh, seem to always have it synced up with a, a very strange awareness of calendar time where they can just, they just know, they, they always know the dates and days of things. And they, you know, they can tell you, you know, whether January twenty fourth, nineteen ninety two, was a Tuesday. You know, I mean, it's just they're 
they, 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 they have and they're not working recall. it out. No, it's just that. So, what is that process? Because we feel free will aside, we feel that we're going through some process of recall, don't we? And they don't. Mm. They just they just have it. So, what's the difference then? What what is making that difference? Well, we we don't know, but we just know that with respect to memory, forget about the calendar component of it. Just the the fact that there's a range of you know talent on this front. I mean, there are people who obviously someone with with dementia is quickly losing the normal range of of memory, but there's the super normal range of memory where you you really can vividly recall more or less any day of your life, and uh, compared to their experience, it's as though the rest of us have dementia of some kind. I mean, what, what I heard one of these oh, people yeah. interviewed, and she, and she was really talking about everyone in her life as though she was surrounded by people with obvious neurological impairments. You know, it's like she's in these relationships with people who can't remember most of their lived experience together, and she remembers everything. And she feels it, she feels it as a loss, right? It's like, like I'm with me, my best friend don't remember all the fun we had together. <laughs> you know, it's pretty interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah. So, so, her, so she feels, she sort of feels let down then, does she? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's like, she's like, surra- she's surrounded by people who have brain damage. Which we all do, don't we? We all, we all get, in, yeah, well, we all certainly get by comparison we go along. with this. Yeah. I mean, I, there, 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 there are few, there's a few weird wrinkles here because some of these people are clearly somewhat troubled by being able to remember everything so vividly. I mean, if you can remember everything, then you can re- you remember every bad thing too. You know, you can relive traumas in, in ways that don't make you happier in the present, right? So, you know, so and some so of these people... so do we people, all automatically sort of suppress those to be, to be happier? Is there a process where we... Yeah, so that, I mean, that's, that's certainly a hypothesis of, you know, why wouldn't we have, have been selected to have just, you know, better and better recall and um and is there any advantage to forgetting and uh, yeah, i think depending on the kind of life a person has i, I think there's um and cer- how certainly does that some work does that work to... like sort of a spotify algorithm like you, you've had that memory twice and you've rejected it twice so it doesn't pop up again mm. like selection of songs so so soon you're happier in yourself because your playlist your playlist of memories is really pleasant and you like them all yeah yeah that's i mean that would that would be uh, that's certainly possible that it's adaptive to have a lower fidelity awareness of what actually happened and even what what's actually happening in the present i mean there's some evidence that being a little bit delusional and biased toward the positive makes you more functional in the present, I mean, just socially functional. If you have, if you, if you well, I wondered that. I, I wondered that. I, I, I've always thought, right, when I was a kid, right, I thought everything was perfect. I thought nature was perfect. Whatever happened, happens. It mm. was, it, it's worked out, right? But I always wondered why, when we get to a certain age, why we didn't start looking forward to death as an evolutionary trait, right? Like, that would be good because there'd be less anxiety. Mm. Like, you know, grandma's looking forward to dying. Oh, good luck, grandma. You know, like, why isn't that a, well, two reasons, isn't it? Because it, it wouldn't be selected, would it? Because it would be, it would be irrelevant to passing on your genetic right. material right. that you were happy when you were. You're just clearing the way for your, your grandkids. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe, do you think religion sort of plugged that hole for a while? Religion certainly gives you a rationale to look forward to death. You know, it, yeah. it, it actually, if you, it, it renders it absolutely mysterious why anyone views death as a problem if they actually believe what they say they believe. You know, for the people who really think they're going to heaven and really yeah. think their loved ones are, are, are going there when they die, it's all upside, really. And I mean, obviously, there are people who, who prove their commitment to this, you know, more or less. Uh, Emphatically, I mean, you know, I have no doubt that most suicide bombers weren't, you know, suicidally depressed before they pulled the trigger. I mean, they, they, these were people who are, are expecting to get to paradise, right? So it really does take, it flips the whole, whole rationale of you know, trying not to die on its head. And do you think spirituality and religion, do you think it was invented in good faith by someone like, mm-hmm. to make you happier? Or the, the, the way forward was always going to be 
an organized religion where you pay me enough and I can get you in. I can get you in free because, or do you think it was someone believed it and passed it on and it, it was a, it was a good meme. Yeah. I, I don't it, think it worked. It's, generally speaking, I don't think it's a cynical manipulation of people. I think people, I, I think it starts with death being so inscrutable. It's just like, how, how is it even possible that we disappear? Right, like that. I do think that sometimes. Sense. I do. I do genuinely with with all my bravado and and uh, you know logic. Well, I've got I've got no choice. There, there. I'm lumbered with it. We all die. That's it. And I believe there's nothing this. So I'm I'm stuck with that. I can't pretend not to believe so much. But more and more, I think that is amazing. That you know, we we just we come from nothing. You know, four hundred trillion to one that we exist at all, mm. and then we have eighty ninety years, and then we never exist again. And then our atoms are just dispersed, like it never happened. That's mind blowing, yeah. really, isn't it? How much is happening in our head now? How big we are in this world to us? We're the, we're the biggest thing in the world. Our brain is a universe, and then that just that just stops, and no one cares. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's really <laughs> it's fucking harsh, isn't it? Yeah. It is harsh, yeah. Because <laughs> that's exactly what happens, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I did a. I did a tweet once. People liked it. I was surprised. Um, I said, uh, whenever you're, you're feeling, you know, your life's terrible and no one loves you, just remember you'll be dead soon. And, <laughs> and, uh, and people were sort of quite liked it. So, yeah, I just think that I, I think a good evolutionary thing would be that uh, not only we knew we were going to die and it was nothingness and we weren't scared of it, but there was something quite comforting about it. I follow some account on Twitter that just sends out the same tweet over and over again. I'm, I'm not, I don't think it's every day, but it's with some regularity. It's, it just tweets, you will die someday. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> right. So why do I find that funny? Well, okay, I, I've been getting that for that. years. Why do I find that funny? Jerry Seinfeld said that comedians have a different brain, so we're more fascinated with death mm -hmm. than other people for some reason. I, I think it's to do with discomfort that, with comedy it's a surprise so if you if you pile on the you know the bad in a joke then it's good at the end that's the right way round isn't it i've always thought that with practical jokes you should give someone bad news and then go no only joke and it's great news <laughs> if it's the other way around right. it's terrible there was a uh, there's stories in the paper where uh, someone has pretended to their husband um they've won the lottery mm. where they you know they've recorded last week's lottery results and that and he's running around, and then they, I think that's that's the wrong way round for a practical joke. That's, oh. the, that's devastating. It does remind me of um, that uh, mortifying scene in The Office where David Brent plays a, a, a practical joke of that structure, pretending that one of the uh, yeah. one of the employees is fired, and then says, "No, yeah. just kidding." You know, uh, of surprise. Course it can. All, <laughs> it all practical jokes can go wrong. It I does. always think that. I, I've I've always liked the idea of. Uh, Fun, fun going wrong. Yeah. I remember there was a, a, what do you think of this, right? There was always a, a thing at school where someone put a drawing pin, you know, a, a tack on that, your chair. That, 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 that's, that's not fun. No, no but it's, it's actual it's the impalement on, on a needle is yeah. not fun. Yeah. It's not like, it's like there was sort of some sort of justice, like you did it to yourself. No, I didn't. You hmm. did it. You might as well have just stabbed me with it. Right. For, for I do, no one checks well, to see if there's a spike on their chair. Yeah. So it's, well, it's well, you're like, getting you're getting penalized for your inattentiveness, right? So that yeah, like, you, you've collaborated only. in your misfortune yeah. by being, yeah. being uh, so inattentive. Yeah. Even the the cup of water over the door is better than that. Mm. You know, at least you know it's something. It doesn't hurt. You get a bit wet, but um, I've always wondered whether people miss out that. That comedic element of a practical joke. Just go, just go, go up to someone and punch me in the face and go, only joking, only joking. Like, it's, it's like, I, I, it, was no, it was an ironic punch in the face. I didn't really mean it. It doesn't count. But yeah, why is that funny that you're going to die soon? Is it because we think of the person who we don't know reading that and being a little bit confused by it? I think it is. I mean, I think the intention of the account is, is not even comedic. It's just a, a reminder that Right. Well, to not, to not waste funnier. your life. Yeah, it's even funnier. Like it's <laughs> medical advice. <laughs> like, yeah. like the, a newsreader, yeah. a newsreader ending with that every night yeah. would be <laughs> my dream society. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Good night. And remember, uh, you're going to die. 
one We're night. all one day closer to death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tuesday, yeah. October 14th, yeah. and well, we're one day closer funny, to isn't death. It? Yeah, discomfort is funny. Mm. Just just like someone just like squirming. I never really think of practical jokes, but I have one friend who plays them with some regularity and he's played some great ones. He had a he had a friend who was um going to get married and he he was asking um, advice about getting an, enga- an engagement ring. And my friend said, "Oh, I have a a jewel a jeweler who you, you have to go to. He's fantastic and he will give you a great discount. Um there's a, there's a code Though you when you you go in there and you you, know, you pick out the ring and at the end of the process you, you you need to tell him that Aladdin is your favorite film and then this will unlock a you know a discount and uh, you know he'll take great care of you and so he sent his friend in to buy an engagement ring with this information and his friend you know went through the whole process bought the ring and and at the end he, he he's you know at the cash register. And uh, he says, I, I just want you to know, uh, you know, Aladdin is my, my favorite film. And the, and the jeweler says, says oh, 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 okay. And he says, he says, no, 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 really, Aladdin really is my favorite film. He's getting nothing from him. <laughs> just, just mortifying. It took him like minutes to realize the situation he was in. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that the, that's funny because they're, you, you you're there with them there yeah. you know you know exactly what's happening and in it's both protracted, their minds. Yeah. like he he yeah i i think uh there was a thing that went around where we used to um get someone to call like uh, in an office job or reception job you'd say oh uh, mr lion called uh is leave this number and they call and it's l y o n right mm-hmm. and they call up and say can i speak to mr lion and it's the zoo right yeah, yeah. and and <laughs> And they, so, but they're used to it. They go, yeah, I think you've been had. They just, they're just so used to it. <laughs> right. I, do, I mean, some some practical jokes are funny. Is there? They mustn't. I, th- I think they mustn't be too stressful or painful. Yeah, you can't put uh, someone well, in, a, in we, a terrible situation. Yeah, well, I used to like frightening myself. I used to like trying to, which you can't. We talked about this. You can't tickle yourself. But I remember, um, like, if I was a kid and I was sort of out in the sea, I'd go too far. I'd go too far, and then I'd convince myself there was a shark until I'd actually really panic and have to swim for my life, like, and take it in water. And I did it more than once because I, why is that? Why do, we, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to frighten ourselves? Hmm. It's so weird. I uh, suppose adrenaline sports are like that, aren't they? Like, well, yeah, jumping I mean, out of a plane. Clearly, That's people weird. are very different in this regard. I, mean, I don't know if you've seen, if you, uh, I mean, we're, we're living in a new age of, high adrenaline you know risk taking where you have people who are climbing these ultra high you know construction cranes and hanging from one hand you know a yeah. you know, thousand feet in the air or, or riding mountain bikes on precipices that are i mean it's just when you when you look i mean the, the scary thing is you know people are getting killed trying to make youtube videos uh, or yeah. twitch videos where wherever they're putting these out now but i mean it's just a ama- the, the level of daredevil behavior yeah, is no, just I've, crazy. I've never done that that big one off chance. Although we're slowly killing ourselves every day. Yeah, I, do, I do it every day with yeah. with cream and and and, yeah. and sugar. Drink, yeah. Drink and yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fat. Some people smoke. Yeah, I've, I've done all those things where you 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 guarantee you're slowly killing yourself, yeah. right? But um I've never done that. You know, I do, I I'm scared. I I check oh, you know, crossing the road. I, I make my driver go at like you know sixty four miles mm. an hour because I think my I've got more chance of a so I've never I've never done that sort of thing. Have um, you have you ever do you have a memory of have you ever almost died where it's just a, just uh, objectively true that had you not uh, looked left before taking that step or whatever there's just no oh, question yes. you were going to hit get yeah. hit by a bus or yeah um, a tram mm. in Austria about thirty years ago I just I, I, because it's the wrong side of the road I just walked in front of it and jane just pulled me back Mm -hmm. and that was that was it i mean i think i've done that a few times you know but you don't even consider it it's like we were talking about before moral luck yeah you don't consider those times but yeah one in a thousand times you're splattered you are at your it's that it's it's the end and i do think about that quite a lot what's amazing is so you you have an experience like that and it's so you know abstract i mean because nothing happened to you right something something almost killed you but in fact you didn't no. you experienced nothing so like I, the, yeah. the, the one that comes to mind for me is i was once driving with a friend 
on a highway, uh, you know, in California, uh, but it's just like a two-lane highway, you know, two, two lanes going in, my, uh, in each direction. So it's a four-lane highway, a divided highway uh, with, a, you know, a grass median in the middle. And I'm driving and, I, and I, I'm driving the car and I see ahead of us that we're gaining on the car in front at a speed that just was uh, unrecognizably fast. I mean, I was probably going 80 miles an hour, but this thing was approaching us at something like 200 miles an hour. And so at the last second, I changed lanes and this car was going the wrong way on a divided highway and just, just missed us, you know, by 18 inches. And you know, all we could do was laugh in the end. It was just such a startling experience, but the experience was over in less than a, you know, a 10th of a second. And, you know, that would, you know, it would have been the end of everything. But what's amazing is that objectively, you know, these moments where essentially you were, you know, you you were almost executed. And yet there's no, like they're, they're, they're so inconsequential in terms of the experiential texture of the, the moment, because it just, you know, it's it's just an idea, really, in the end, that you were that close to death. Whereas there's you, other things like going to the grocery store and, and forgetting to buy something that you needed for dinner that night is a is a much bigger stress, right? I mean, it's just it's crazy how it, it yeah. leaves no mark. Yeah, well, it's 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 strange because there's no there's literally no consequence. There's literally yeah. no it's zero. It's not like a percentage. Like you go, that was close, so you get five out of 10 consequences. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I, and we don't think about those things. When I, I look back and I think there's, there's many, there's, there's lots, you know, you know, walking along a, across a, along a wall. When I was a kid, my mum shouting, get down. I used to jump off the shed mm-hmm. and land yeah. okay and take the chance, right? But um, yeah, and now I just rule, <laughs> I roll all of that out of my life. I, I, <laughs> right, I don't, the, the biggest chance I take is a joke that some people will find offensive right. you know that's the most that's the most that's the most dangerous thing i do say <laughs> stuff which is you know can be pretty dangerous these days <laughs> but um i know yeah talking about that um the, the trauma uh, and back to mm-hmm. memory i um i was reading this thing uh, where when you walk along the street because nothing's important you're going to daily business you're not you're not looking at something you're not seeing stuff you're not looking at the number plate you're not looking at people's faces you're just going to work but uh, on a day where you suddenly hear a squeal and a, a car mounts the curb and is coming towards you at high speed, you see the face of the driver, you see the number plate, you jump out of the way. And someone said that's akin to you're taking in more information. Mm-hmm. So when you play it back, it's like, you're, you, it's like you've recorded it at double speed and yeah. you're playing it back at normal speed. So you remember more. Is that a thing? Is that real? Is that a yeah. what is that process well, in reality? Well, phenomenologically, it, it certainly seems to be real. I mean, the, the time slowing down. I mean, people have this experience in car accidents and other emergencies where they they seem to be like that. The bandwidth of consciousness seems to grow, and you're taking in more detail as it's unfolding. You know what what really was in fact just a few seconds. It seemed to dilate, and there was much more information available. I think that is, I don't know to what degree that has been tested because it's, it's hard to see how to provoke that kind of high adrenaline experience in people, you know, so ethically. So do you think it's physical then? So you've got an adrenaline rush, you've got yeah. all your senses go, like going, this is really important, concentrate. So we know, we, we know some of the brain regions involved in this and, and how they, they operate. I mean, so the, the chief one here is the amygdala, which begins its response to danger before you're consciously aware of the danger. I mean, so, like, so when something, when you're startled by something, some, uh, you know, you open the door to your house and, you know, someone's standing there uh, when you didn't expect it, right? And you, you get this adrenaline experience. That before you processed it, you mean, before you're thinking that's a man in my house. Exactly. You have the same, you, you have the immediate fear, the chemical fear yeah. without you Bef- yeah, that, that the, okay. the fear response has begun before the conscious impression of the, the visual, the visual reason for it, and so and it, so it is with a, thing, a though, sound. Isn't it? That is just you, 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 you have noticed that your your subconscious your brain. I don't again, I don't know the terminology, but as a as a being, you have noticed something, mm. or like a, a loud sound. You know, if, if a loud yes. sound that startles you, 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 you can actually know if you pay attention, you can see this that there's a 
or you can feel this. There, there is a um, when you when you the, your awareness of the sound as a sound follows yes. this initial startle response. I mean, you're you're startled before you actually are consciously appreciating the sound as a sound, and yes. uh, and so it is with um, like touching a hot stove. You know, your 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 reflex, the reflex arc that's causing you to pull your hand back. Is initiated before your hand is actually in pain, so it's uh, it's just interesting. It's just there's so and is that the first? So if you're walking on the street and you hear a, a, a gunshot, mm -hmm. right? You jump and they're but if if you're waiting for a, a twenty one gun salute, you're ready right. for them. You don't have that, do you? you just yeah. you just know it's going to happen. Yeah, that, well, that, you know, that's very interesting. Yeah. But that, that that's yeah, you have a, a kind of higher level schema for what to expect in a situation. Because so much of perception is predictive and when you have a predictive schema that essentially is alerting you to the fact that you're going to hear a lot of gunshots over the course of this hour you still might be startled i mean if you're not if you're, if you're not used to gunshots they're, they're probably they're, they might still startle you but you can be used to them enough and expect them such that they're not startling you at all really uh, and that's just that's a, a kind of top-down control reminds me of a, a joke there's an out of work actor and he's nearly going to give up and he's he can't pay his rent and he's going to have to move out. And he gets a call from his agent. He goes, look, I've got you, a, I've got you one line in a play. And he goes, amazing. Right? He goes along and the director goes, what? He goes, um, yeah, uh, it, we, we've lost our guy. Doing this. It's just one line. You walk out and you have to say, who fired that cannon? We've got your costume and everything. See you at 7.30 tonight. He goes, great. So he gets on this, this guy's costume. He's great. amazing. He's got a line. He's getting, getting paid. He goes, who fired that cannon? He goes home. He has a shower. He's looking in the mirror going, who fired that cannon? Right, he gets ready, goes to the stage door. He's ready, he goes, curtain up. He's going, who fired that cannon? He's waiting by the wings. And the, the director goes, now. He walks out. There's a big bang. He goes, what the fuck was that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you, it's hard to surprise yourself. That's, the, that's, what, I've, that's what we want. Yeah, but we you, want can't, to to... you, can't surprise, you can't quite surprise yourself because you have a it's like we we spoke about this at one point. You can't tickle yourself because you have a copy yeah. of all the motor movements you're putting out there. And uh, I was trying to explain that to someone, but I couldn't. I'd forgotten the explanation for it. <laughs> why why can't you tickle yourself? Well, because so you know what you know you the not the conscious you, but the, the total you, the you the the brain knows what your hand is going to do next. Right, so it's you. You it has a forward-looking copy of your motor movements, so they're unsurprising. You, you you are both the initiator of the movements and the receiver of the movements. You're the tickler and the tickle-y. Yeah. And in receiving the sensation of your hand, there's no surprise. You know, there's just the fulfillment of the motor plan that is expected. Whereas with someone else's hand, you have no idea what they're doing that going to do next. So it's all. What if they did the same thing every time? But you mean you mean it's you. You're playing yourself at chess. You can't hmm. do a surprise move. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. I know. I I bet there is some some way you could be tickled by another person if it was truly repetitive. You could habituate to the same sensations, and maybe maybe they would would no longer be ticklish. I think that's if it's. If it's the same from moment to well, moment I think in every you can respect. Because um, I had a treatment where they were doing something and it was ticklish the first couple of times. And mm -hmm. then they went, relax, relax, you know, breathe. And then it, it didn't hurt at all. And I, right. I think that's, that's probably more, I don't know if that's psychological or your, your body getting used to it. But there must, it, there's some sort of loop happening that you can't, you can't yeah, surprise yourself in the mm -hmm. loop. Yeah. I, I like the term tickly. <laughs> I, I, I think I coined that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, if, I don't know if that's ever been used. <laughs> I think that might be your legacy. Yes. <laughs> get, 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 let's get that into the. I've made my mark. Particularly, <laughs> 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 someone just tuning in, just right. turning on, right? Just getting that bit on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. My, right. my my work oh. here is done. Yeah, yeah, good. All right. Well, well, yeah, I think we've sorted that out. Memory, getting practical jokes, and the the new term tickle league. Yeah, yeah. Good.